The Lord be with you and welcome to online worship from First United Methodist Church in Hanover, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Greg and I welcome you. I'm glad that you are here. This is our third Sunday in the season of Lent. It's a 40-day period of preparing for the celebration of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's also a time to look at our soul, look at our life, look back over our days and ask yourself, how satisfied are you with your walk with Jesus Christ? How satisfied is God? Are there some changes you want to make? Are there some improvements? Are there some sins that you want to break, some habits you want to change? Is there uh, a willingness to serve in new ways? And whatever it might be, this is what God does with us in the season of Lent. And so today, we're going to be doing a couple of things that are going to help you in that time of inspecting your life and your heart and your soul. We're going to be looking at a different form of prayer today called meditation or Christian meditation. And don't worry, it's not difficult. As you're going to find, if, if you know how to worry about stuff, then you can learn how to meditate upon the positive things of God. We'll get to that in just a moment. Not only that, this is a communion Sunday, so I hope that you are prepared with uh, some sort of bread and some sort of grape juice or wine. And uh, uh, if not, you can pause the, the video now and go gather that up and have it ready for later in the service as we break the bread and share the cup of salvation together. We're going to begin worship now, and it's time to sing. If we have prayed only for what is possible and hoped only for what we can see, if we have taken your grace for granted and expected instant answers to our prayers, if we have allowed waiting on your spirit to slip into laziness, if we have thought only of you waiting on us and not pondered our service to you, in mercy forgive us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh 
foundation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Holy Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi friends, I'm so glad you're here to worship today. So today we're going to be talking about prayer. Well, I have some questions. Who can pray? Anybody can pray. What do you think we should pray about? Hmm. We can pray about anything. Where can we pray? That's a tricky question. Guess what? You can pray anywhere. When can you pray? You're right, you can pray any time. And why do we pray? Well, we want to talk to God and to Jesus because they love us more than anybody else could ever love us. And how do we pray? Now that is very interesting because I have seen people praying in all kinds of different ways. I have seen them folding their hands and bowing their head closing their eyes. I've seen people put their hand on their heart. I've seen people cover their head. I've seen people raise their hands up to the sky. And I even saw a person spinning around and around and around and praying while she was doing it. So pretty much anything goes. Well, a lot of people say, well, what should I pray for? Hmm. I found this prayer to help me remember, and it's called the hand prayer. Pray for your concerns, your hopes, your dreams, things that you're afraid of. Pray for, ooh, how about this one? Pray for those who are an example of Christian life, like maybe your pastor, your Sunday school teachers, the people here at church. How about the people that lead us? That means, how about our principals and our teachers and even the people who are employers who your mom and dad go to work, so we need to pray for them. How about we pray for our friends and our family? And how about we pray for all people who are sick or weak or homeless or poor or uneducated, all of our neighbors, our neighbors in need. So that's one way I can I remember how to pray. I also found a really cool prayer about jelly beans. And because it's almost Easter, I bought a bag of jelly beans. And I even have them in my little container. And I have red. Red is for the blood he gave. So we thank God for Jesus, for giving us Jesus. Green is for the grass and the world that God made. Thank you, God, for the world, the grass, the flowers. Yellow is for the sun so bright in the sky. Thank you, Lord, for the sun. Orange is for sunset, the end of the day. Black is for, this is for us guys, this is for the naughty stuff we do, the sins that we do. We want God to forgive us. White, uh oh, hey guys, I don't have a white, so we're gonna do a little pretending. Is for the grace, because God forgives us those sins that we do. And purple, purple, sometimes when we're sad, 
we should pray and say, hey God, I'm sad, please help me. And pink, well pink is for our hopes and our dreams and our tomorrows. So there you go guys, there's lots of different things you can pray for and lots of different ways you can pray and I bet you have a hundred ideas of things we could pray for. But right now, let's pray together. We just thank you, God, for giving us Jesus and giving us a time that we can talk to you with our prayers because we know that you love us forever and ever and ever, no matter what. Everybody say, Amen. Remember, wash your hands, say those prayers, because germs and Jesus are everywhere. Bye. Our scripture lesson today is Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Here ends the reading. You know, this won't come as a surprise to hear this, but we human beings have an unlimited capacity to destroy our own lives. One stupid decision, one rash choice, one unguarded moment, and the consequences can bury us. You know, a lot of us have no interest in God, really, until we are completely out of options, and we need help fixing the mess that we've made. King David in the Bible had everything going for him, power and reputation and wealth. He even enjoyed the divine blessing of God who anointed him the king over Israel. He was described by God as a man after God's own heart. But then he used his power to seduce a married woman who became pregnant in the encounter. And when he was unable to cover up this rape, he arranged the murder of her husband and then took her as his own wife. Now David, too, was already married, and the jealousies and the resentments of his wives, yes, multiple wives, and their children drove a wedge of deep rivalry and distrust through his family. And in time, his son Absalom incited a rebellion and set himself up as king, establishing his rule in the city of Hebron. Now David was branded an enemy of the state and he was to be killed on sight. So he ran for his life, fleeing the city and hiding out in the desert. It's been said that you haven't truly hit rock bottom until you are on your knees. Well, David hit rock bottom out there and he fell to his knees in the desert and he prayed. And I'm sure he prayed the way we prayed last week, just pouring out everything before God. Prayer, we learned last week, is being completely honest with God, letting God be a part of everything going on around us and inside of us. It's holding nothing back. Well, David did that. We do that too, don't we? There are very few rules to prayer, but the first one is to just dump it all out before God and don't hold anything back. Be honest about what you've done. Be honest about what has been done to us. Be honest about how you feel about it. Be honest with your doubts and your questions and your hang-ups. Just keep talking until everything swimming around in your head has been dumped out at God's feet. And you'll know when you're finally done because you will finally run out of things to say. And it might take a long time. That's okay. Just keep going. You will probably feel better when you reach the end because it helps to just get it out. It helps us to understand our problems better when we explain them to someone else. There's a healing in that. 
That's when we are tempted to thank God for listening, say amen, and then go on with our day. But just because we told God all about it doesn't mean that the problems are solved. And that brings us to the second rule of prayer. Listen to God's reply. Now, while talking to God may be pretty easy, listening to God takes a little bit of work. In Psalm 63, David models for us this deeper aspect of prayer. Notice how David describes the state of his heart, the posture of his soul, now that he has brought his need before God. He says, and I quote, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. See, David hears from God, but not through a burning bush like Moses, not through the silent voice like the prophet Elijah. David hears God as he meditates. Now, meditation in our society has a lot of different connotations. Often when we hear the word, we think of someone in India doing yoga or chanting with incense. That's a kind of meditation. Christian meditation, however, is not about chanting or burning incense. It's simply about thinking, but it's a particular kind of thinking. Christian writer and theologian Richard Foster suggests that anyone who knows how to worry can meditate because they both involve thinking. When we worry, we dwell on our problems. We rehearse them in our minds, turning them over, examining them and how big they are. And have you ever noticed that the longer we think about the problems we have, the worse they get? By contrast, when we meditate, Foster says, we think about not the bad things in our life, but we think about the good things of God. And we turn those over and over and over again in our minds, taking comfort from how they help us get to know God better. Now, I'm sure I don't have to teach you to worry, but this is what it might sound like to meditate on God. It might begin by reminding ourselves of some small promise of God, like, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, just let that sink in for a minute. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say it over and over a couple of times and just let it sink in. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so what does that mean to me? It means that no matter what I'm facing, no matter how hopeless it feels, no matter how badly I mess things up, God will never leave me nor forsake me. God will never leave me. God has never left me. I may not always feel it, but God is with me. Even when I feel all alone, God will always be with me. And that reminds me of another promise that nothing is impossible for God. And that means that if God is with me, nothing is impossible with God who is with me, so I might just get through this. It means that because I'm focusing on God rather than my hopeless problems, I feel a little bit better. That's how meditation works, really. Somewhere in all that thinking and all of that imagining and meditating, God speaks. Not to my ear, but to my imagination, to my conscience, to my heart. God responds. Now, it may not sound different to us than our own thoughts, but if we come out of the other side of this with more hope and more peace and a deeper faith, then it's God. This is one way to listen to God. Foster goes on to say that meditation is listening to and obeying God. It's as simple as that. It's listening to what God has to say and then thinking about what God has said, mulling it over, examining it, exploring it, so that we can obey it. A second way to listen to God in meditation is to look back over our day and reflect where God has been with us. It's called the Prayer of Examine, and it's been practiced by Christian believers since the days of St. Ignatius in the 1500s. That's a long time ago. 
Ignatius believed that by reflecting on our days in this way, we increase our sensitivity to the workings of God in our life. So he believed that God often speaks to us through our deepest feelings and longings, through what he calls consolation, which is the good stuff, and desolation, which is the bad stuff. We would say that God speaks through the good things as well as the bad things in our lives if we tune our ears to hear it. Consolation, according to Ignatius, can be defined as whatever draws you closer to God, fills you with life, makes you feel that all is right with the world. Desolations are the opposite. It's those things that pull us away from God, alienate us from other people, and drain us of our energy and our hope and our vitality. This would allow us to be attentive to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and it creates a space for God to shape our souls and direct our lives. And as we wrap our time together this morning, I want to take just a few moments to experience and practice this prayer of examine together. So to begin a, a practice of examine, or literally examining my day, it's really easy. Number one, sit down quietly and relax. I think you're there. Think back over the last 24 hours and look for your moments of consolation. For example, you might ask, what am I most grateful for today? What experience of the day felt most life-giving to me? When today did I feel most contented, most like myself? When did I sense God's presence most fully today? Think again through the last day and look for the moments of desolation, the bad stuff. And you can use these kinds of questions to find it. For what moment in the last day am I least grateful? What experience of this day drained life from me? When, did I, when today did I feel the most discontented and uncomfortable and the least like myself? When did God seem far away? When did God seem absent today? And then spend a moment in prayer thanking God for both the good stuff and asking him for help with the bad stuff. This can be a great way to spend time with God at the end of the day, maybe when you turn off the lights and lay your head on the pillow, unwind together before going to sleep. Regardless of how today went, God can show us how to make tomorrow just a little bit better. And a third way to listen to God prayerfully is feasting on the scriptures and letting God speak to us as we read. But we're going to wait and share that one next week. Remember, if you know how to worry about the bad stuff in your life, you already have the skills to meditate and think about the good stuff of God. Spend some time with that this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as we did last week, during our time of prayer, I want to give you a chance to practice what we talked about today. And again, if we know how to worry, and I know we all know how to worry, uh, when we worry, we just let the bad things uh, go over and over and over in our mind, and we just focus on that, and we can be overwhelmed by it. Today, I want to practice this idea of Christian meditation. I want to think of a, of a promise uh, of God that we can focus on. Um, here's one. Uh, just pulling this one from random uh, in our, uh, our scripture today. It says, um, it says, your steadfast love is better than life. Your steadfast love is better than life. I'm just going to use a tiny little Scripture, And that's what we're going to meditate on in the next couple of moments. Your steadfast love is better than life. Now, steadfast is not the kind of word that we use every day. Steadfast means it, it holds up. Uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't go away. It endures. Steadfast love is a love that you can count on. It will always be there, and it will hold up through anything. God's steadfast, strong, enduring love is better than life itself. Now, I don't know what kind of season of life you are in right now, whether, you're, whether life is as good as it's ever been or as bad as it has ever been. Life is a mixed bag. We know that. There are mountaintop moments and there are deep, dark valleys. 
but all of life together is nothing compared to the steadfast love of God. So in this moments of silence, I want you to just think about the fact that the steadfast love of God isn't going anywhere, and it's better than life. It's better than life. So I want you to think about um, all the times that you have gone through that were difficult, that were painful, that were ugly, and you felt like you were all alone. According to this scripture, God's steadfast love was with you, which meant God loved you right straight through it. And it means whatever you're going through now, God will love you through it. And whatever you might face in the future, God will love you through it. There are no rules about how you think about that. We're just going to have a moment of quiet, and then I'm going to let you think. That think is a kind of prayer called meditative prayer, because God's steadfast love is better than life. Let's reflect upon that. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that your steadfast love is better than life. And in these quiet moments, we have been reflecting with you about all the times that you have loved us through the pain and celebrated the joy with us, too. We are going to hold this as a promise, regardless of what we're dealing with, regardless of what yet lies ahead. Your steadfast love endures through it all. We thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing upon our nation, upon our world, upon our family, our congregation, and our neighborhood. We ask you for the forgiveness of our sins and love us into a fresh start that begins today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. As I often remind you and thank you, thank you again for all the ways that you have continued to financially support the ministries of First United Methodist Church. We are slowly reopening. Uh, we are open on Sunday morning for two services in a modified schedule. Uh, we are uh, open for worship on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. and at 9.30 a.m. Masks are required and we do have a few of the pews that are marked off to increase the, the social distance, but it has been good to be back in the same room together, And uh, but we also assure you that we are committed to doing that as safely as we can. Continue to pray for the, uh, the vaccination process, and we ask that if you are still working and worshiping from home, that you would still continue to support God's work in the world through First United Methodist Church through your financial giving. You can do that remotely by writing a check out to First United Methodist Church of Hanover and mail it into our church office, which is 200 Frederick Street, Hanover, PA, 17331. You can call our financial secretary, Holly Filippo, and you can ask her how to set up online giving, uh, electronic giving, so that your bank wires your offering directly to the church's bank. Uh, and third, if you want to go to our church website and click on the giving tab, you'll find uh, a resource there called Easy Tithe, and Easy Tithe allows you to make an online gift using either a personal credit or debit card. In all the ways that you give, we just want to thank you, and we offer God's blessing to direct that giving to the best way to build his kingdom. Thank you. Every week on the first Sunday, the first weekend uh, of every month, we share Holy Communion 
here at First United Methodist Church in Hanover. Uh, we do that a number of different ways whenever we are here together in person. And uh, right now, we're using this way, which seems a little bit different to us. Uh, it's a little uh, sealed cup that has the juice in it, and then up on top, there's a little wafer here. I'm going to be using this for Holy Communion, uh, because this is what I'll be using this Sunday as well, uh, in person. But uh, you uh, should hopefully have ready before you uh, your communion elements, some sort of, uh, of, of baked bread, some sort of grape juice or, or wine. If you do not have that in front of you right now, uh, you can take just a moment, pause this video, uh, grab it, get it in front of you. Uh, we're going to start by praying the prayer of great thanksgiving. Christ our Lord, invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. So let's draw near with faith, make a humble confession of our sins, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Father, trusting in our own goodness, but rather we trust in your unfailing goodness, not our own, your steadfast love that endures forever. We know that we are not worthy that you should receive us, but you love us. So give us your word and we shall be forgiven. Give us your word and we shall be healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that is proof of God's unending love toward us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And so, as a people who are forgiven and free, we lift up our hearts and we give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and to be loved. When our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast and it endured forever. In time, Lord, you made covenant to be our sovereign God. You provide for our needs. You gave your law and your commandments and speak through the holy prophets. And in the fullness of time, you made a new covenant through water and the spirit in the life and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, O God. He broke the bread and then gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, Christ took the cup, and after giving thanks to you, he handed it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And now, Heavenly Father, we offer ourselves to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may we be one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we all sit down together at his heavenly banquet table. In Christ, with Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. I encourage you to take your bread today and know that this is the body of Christ which is broken to make us whole. Take and eat. Amen. I want to encourage you to take your cup this morning and know that this is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins and the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. Take and drink. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God on this 
Sunday of the season of Lent, as we are learning to pray, as we are learning to spend more time in quiet, examining our souls, looking back over our lives, and looking forward to a new life with you. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that in the eating of this bread and sharing of this cup, we are nourished by your Holy Spirit, strengthened for the task ahead to serve you as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. technology. We've been to church today. We've been joined together in worship of the God that creates us, sustains us, loves us, redeems us, and gives us an eternal home. So I want to thank you for being a part of that. Not only that, we taught you a new skill, and that is Christian meditation. Remember, all you need to do is grab some positive thing about God and just turn it over in your mind. And when you focus on the positive things of God rather than the negative things of this world, Rather than being dragged down into the mire of this world, we are lifted up uh, into the glory of God. And that's a great thing. I wish that for you this week. That whatever burden you're dealing with, God can lift you up. That you can feel lighter. That you can feel a peace. That you can feel His joy. I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as we go now in peace. Hey, have a great week, everybody. God bless you, and come on back next time. We'll see you.